Okay, next thing then is making it so that when all the targets are shot down, we open a door to the next room, which will have more targets in which we can shoot down, which will open another door, and so on. Before we can do this, we need to do a few things. We need to basically build a little wall here for there to be a door in. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this quite quickly because I don't want to spend the whole video laying out walls, is going to rotate, alt drag to copy rotate this, move it over here, move it down, scale it to be taller, that'll do. I'm going to move again and do a move copy with alt drag to there, and then just fill in uh, like that. All right, good. And then the question is, how wide is that gap? So I want the door to be about 400 across, 400 on real, well, 400 centimeters, because on real works in centimeters. So let's measure this gap. We go into a 2D view, the top down view specifically. And as you may be aware, in a 2D view in Unreal, if you hold mid middle mouse and drag, it lets you measure. So we're going to measure from there to there. And that's coming out to 520. So let's move this back a bit. Measure again, 450. So the grid is spaced every 10. So if I move this back by five grid spaces, four, five, we should have a gap of exactly 400. Yes. Good, so if I make my door 400, it will fit exactly there. The door is going to be a very simple blueprint. We right click in the content browser and make a new blueprint. It's inheriting from actor, and we're going to call it bp underscore door. And all this is going to have is a static mesh component and then a timeline to make it sort of slide out of the way. It's going to be like a sliding door. It will slide into those walls that I just made. Uh, add component static mesh let's call that door mesh you could have just used a cube component here because all i'm going to do is set that to be cube in fact if you've got a proper sliding door mesh you can use that i'm just using these simple shapes just to keep you know keep the video length down um right now we want this to be a four meters wide by four meters tall by not very thick door it's already it's a one meter by one meter by one meter cube so if we scale it to be Four times the size in X, 0 0.2 let's say in Y to make it thinner, and then 4 in Z. We've now got this 4 by 4 um, door. And to make it open, we're going to have a timeline animate its X position, so it just slides away like that. It's just one way of doing this. There's a few ways of doing this. Right, so event graph. Delete everything that's here because we don't need it. We're going to add a custom event. And we're going to call this open door. An open door just needs a timeline. Just add timeline. We've mentioned we've been through the ins and outs of timelines earlier in the series, so let's do this one quite quickly. Um, what do we want? Length of five seconds, bit long. Let's have a length of two seconds. That's how long it's going to take this door to slide. Add a float track. We'll call this door x position. Door X relative position technically, but never mind. Right click to add a key, that can be time zero value zero. Right click to add another key, that can be time zero value 400. Uh, time two value 400, sorry. Not time zero. There we go. And you can't have two keys at the same time. So we've got time zero value zero and time 2 seconds value 400. Zoom, zoom, so we can see the whole line. And instead of this very linear movement like this, I'm going to right click on the first key and choose key interpolation auto. That will give it this nice smooth, like the, the mesh will sort of accelerate and decelerate rather than move at the same speed the whole time. It'll just look a little bit better. And with that done, we go back to event graph, drag in our door mesh, drag away from that and do a set relative location. And then similar to what we did with the rotations with our timelines, we wire update into here, right click on the new location and go split struct pin and just wire door X position into here. This time, Y and Z want to stay as zero, not wherever they were. Well, they'll just be zero. I'll show you why. Back on the viewport tab, what set relative location is doing is equivalent to you clicking on this component and sort of moving it around like this. Now the X we do want to change. In fact, it's going to move this way, isn't it? It's going to go positive 400 this way. The Y and Z 
we don't want to change those. We want to leave them on zero. Unless you want your door to slide into the ground, in which case you can use uh, Z instead of X. To do that, you'd make it a negative 400 and just wire it into Z instead. But I'm just going to leave it like this. Ah, uh, that's basically finished. The target room now... Actually, let's place the door in first. Let's drop that there. It should be the exact width if you've done your width 400 of the gap. And the door 400, same as mine. There we go. Then this blueprint, the box, the target area, it, it may be easier to select its default scene route there than the actual wireframe box itself. But anyway, this needs a variable over here in its details panel to say which door it, it's meant to open. Because there could be 10 or 20 doors in the level, depending on how big you make it. How that's going to work is go back in BP target room and we're going to add a new variable called door to next room and the variable type is going to be our door blueprint that we've just made bp underscore door and then what's going to happen is instead of printing all targets destroyed so we can delete that we're going to take our door to next room and then from there we can call that open door event that we just set up you know what the one with the timeline and wire that in like this all right, good. Let's give that a test then, see if there's any bugs that we need to come back to. All right, so we play. Doors closed. Walk forwards, targets pop up. Targets get destroyed, and then when the last one is destroyed... Okay, didn't... What is not working? Ax oh, yeah, I haven't set which door it is. Okay, my mistake. So we've created this variable, door to next room. But I never set it to anything, and so here, when it tried to do this, it generated an error saying, you know, door to next room isn't set to anything. It, it was like up here when this was in valleys and it gave an error. And we'd fix that. Select our area. And we can't see that variable, so we need to go back into target room. We've got door to next room, this little eye icon next to it. If you click that and then compile, what happens is that variable now shows up in the details panel for this target area, target room, and next to it you've got this little pick actor from scene. So we can click on that, click on this door, and then that's the step that I didn't do. So now we've said for this particular target room, its door to next room variable is pointing to this door specifically. So if there's nothing else wrong, When we fire at the last target and destroy it, yeah, then the door slides open and we go through. And then what we do here is, uh, just to prove, like, we basically got everything set up now. These blueprints are reusable enough that what we want to do next will just work. Tell you what, let's grab those two walls. I'll drag them over here, rotate them, say, this way by 90 degrees, and just build another little area over here. Uh, maybe I'll drag them next to each other like that so we get a bit more space. If I could shrink this, I could have just extended those ones, couldn't I? Let's put that there. Then we'll copy the walls and door. So if I get that wall, that door, and that wall, and do an alt rotate copy on them, and just move these into place something like that. That will do. Now we need to set up the targets in the target room and then all will be fine. And what we can do here is, if I drag this target panel in, put say, one of those there. In fact, if, yeah, that's fine. Put another one of those here, another one of those here. You can lay these out however you want again. Let's put a couple of spinning targets behind them this time. And then for the round targets, these might be a little bit fiddly to place. Drop in BP round target, move that up. Rotate it back so the pivot is at the front. Slide that this way and let's see. Back a little bit more I think and then rotate downwards. 
Uh, maybe come back just a touch more. Okay, and then let's copy some of those in. Put one over there, and how's that look? Okay, so that's our second room. And then what we need is another one of those target area. The target room, sorry, we called it, didn't we? So let's grab BP target room. Put that in here, move that up a bit. And if you remember how these work, it needs to be big enough to cover all of the targets that are meant to be included inside it. If I do something like that, and remember, the targets are revealed when the player walks into this box, so I don't want it coming right the way up to the door because I want there to be a little gap where the player walks through here, gets to this far, then all the targets pop up. Let's make sure I've got them in the right space. Yeah, so covers all the targets, is as far back as we need it to be, and then what we need to do is what I forgot to do just now is change its door to next room variable to point to this door instead, so that's the one that will open. Let's give this a quick test. So here's our first room. That still works. Our second room, we walk forwards. These ones pop up. For some reason, the these ones have decided not to. Is it that weird thing that I was showing you before, that bug where... Okay, one of two things happened. I might... Ah, no, wait, that's not quite low enough, is it? See how my box stops there. Be careful of that. That might need... Extending a little bit. Well, I think what was happening was these targets weren't technically inside the box because it finished a little bit above the floor. One way to find out, let's test it again. That opens. And then, yeah, this the, the box didn't come all the way down to the floor. Now it does. And then this door. Okay, good, got it. Okay, and then. There's no point in me building another room. I mean, you could carry on this for as long as you wanted, having the player go upstairs or down into a basement, you know, room after room. All the rooms could be decorated differently because you could use proper meshes and textures and materials and everything instead of these just default things that I'm using here. You get the idea. Now that we've got these target blueprints set up, the base and the three that inherit from it, the target room and the door, we can just keep on reusing these over and over and it's you know, really quite flexible. And of course, you can add other target types if you want another type that's not this one, this one, or this one, just inherit from target base again and go through the steps to add the behavior you want. The last thing I will do is we'll add a system of timing so that when the final target has been destroyed, the player gets a, here's how long it took you to do it. To do that, let's think, so we time it from when the game starts, we'll keep it simple because it's at the end of this series, we'll do a from when the player starts to when the last target is destroyed is what we're timing. We'll right click in the content browser to make a new blueprint. It's going to be an actor again and we'll call this BP underscore, what should we call it, target range timer. Okay, double click to open that. And then this doesn't need any components, just a bit of logic on the event graph. It's going to be very similar in principle to stuff we've already done. We're just going to, in the same way that we check have all the targets been destroyed in a given area, we just want to check have all the targets been destroyed in the level and um, have some kind of timer counting up for that. Um, to begin with, let's go to event begin play and get all of the targets and store them in a list. That can be done with a get all actors of class and that will be target base again this is very similar to what we did in the level blueprint so we grab hold of every target base or thing that inherits from target base everywhere in the level do a promote to variable so we store those in an array and we'll call that something like all targets and then the tick function is going to be very much the same as what we did in the um Targeting. I'm sorry to duplicate things, but this is just this will work. First of all, though, we want to do an extra little bit of timing, so we can use this delta seconds to count how long the player has been playing. We add a variable. We'll call this something like total time. Total time can be a float. 
which start off on zero. Then every tick, what we do is get total time and add on to it, so float plus float, whatever delta seconds is, and then store the result of that back in here. And then from here onwards, it's pretty much just check to see if all these have, targets have been destroyed, which we've done before. We want a variable called all targets destroyed, question mark. That is a boolean. Then, as before, we'll start off by assuming that's true. Um, then get the all targets and loop through them and check are they all valid using a for each loop. Now, you could do this in other ways. Like you could, instead of checking have all targets been destroyed, you could have some kind of boolean flag on target room saying room completed and then check are all the rooms completed. Or some other timing mechanism, it's up to you. Let's put the is valid in here again. If we find any target that is still valid, we will set all targets destroyed to false. And then once again, have a branch down here. When the loop completes, we check the value of all targets destroyed. If it's true, the player has destroyed them all, obviously. In which case, we will stop the tick from running. Uh, set actor tick enabled, which means this process of counting the time will stop happening and we can just print the final time on the screen using a print string. Now you could go off and do some fancy UI stuff for this. That's really outside of this tutorial. This is really a blueprint tutorial. I don't think there's any UI stuff on the channel. If we want to do some UI stuff, we can do, but just not in this particular thing. And that should work, unless there's any weird bugs. Let's find out. There sometimes is. Let's drop a BP target range timer anywhere in the level. It doesn't matter where this goes, it can be anywhere. And then hit play and see what we get. So we walk forward, that sort of works, obviously. We're not printing the time on the screen as the player's playing. I suppose that's one improvement we could have done. Then after the last target is destroyed, there we get 14.677 so many seconds. It only appeared for um, a couple of seconds, so what I suppose I should have done was go in here and change this to 30. Again, that would in reality be some fancy UI stuff. I suppose you could always count how many bullets it's taken to do this as well and get an accuracy score. You know, work out from bullets fired and bullets they hit what your accuracy is. There we are, 11.082 whatever seconds, but not very accurate. In any case, I think I'll leave this series there. I hope that's been useful. A little bit about how blueprints and inheritance work. And we've got a little target range out of it. You could extend this to go much further with different target types, different rooms, and like I say, accuracy counters and all the stuff that you want. Um, please leave any comments you have below, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.